Yes, how are you? It's, I'm good. How's it going? I'm all right. Where are you hanging out right now? Uh, Toronto right now. Currently at an Airbnb because I have to work a lot, but I'm trying not to expose my folks when they're out here. So at an Airbnb in Toronto. Wow, that's crazy. Well, thank you for joining us on this Zoom interview. I mean, Where? what'd you say? Where are you at? I'm actually in Minneapolis, Minnesota, so another cold city. Oh, nice. Oh, that's right, Minneapolis. That's right. Crazy. Yeah. Are you in your house? Yeah, my apartment. Last time you were here, I think you played in St. Paul, right? Mm. Honestly, it's all like, it, it. my brain started to just mesh everything together. So it's all kind of just been this big freaking blur of what happened and, and everywhere we've been. It's nuts. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited to be talking to you because I know your first official album just dropped about a month ago, but I've been watching you since 2017. Since 2017. Yeah. I mean, my straight jacket's custom made too. So I hey, mean, tell them. <laughs> what is the process like though? Since uh, 2017, when Kiddo sort of came out and now all the way towards before Love Came to Kill Us, what was that journey like? Mm, a lot of highs and lows. A lot of, um, a lot of late nights. And I'd say early mornings, but the late nights end up turning into early mornings. So it's just been a lot of work. Um, obviously fun in between doing shows and everything, but there's been a lot. There's been lost. There's been, there's been people I've lost. There's been new friends I've made. There's been mm, like injuries, back injuries, that back injury that I don't, I didn't know if I'd come back from last year when we had to cancel a bunch of shows and, it was it was fucked like it was a point where I couldn't walk and I and I and I had to kind of face this fear that I never really faced before of like oh it could all be over like my entire profession could just be down the drain because of this one injury that prevented me from singing I couldn't even sing because because the doctor I, I tried to go to the studio and I was limping and I still couldn't walk right and then the next day I woke up worse and my whole body was like this and I called my doctor and he was like you can't do that you can't go to the studio you can't sing because you're putting abdominal what did he call? he called it like abdominal pressure also goes to your hernia or your herniated disc so you can't do that either I was, how did I was, you hurt yourself in the first place that is so that is so it was a it was a concert and it was um being human in public was out so right in between so kiddo was out being human in public was out and before love came to kill us wasn't out yet and um you know those days that you ever feel like the universe talks to you? Like, mm -hmm. like science. It was one of those, it was one, like, between those two days, things just started going left. Just started going left. And I wasn't really paying, had I been paying attention, I feel like I'd be more cognizant, but you know, 20, like, retrospect is 2020, rear view is 2020. But like, my guitar broke at the airport. All this shit started happening before the show. Right. At home, I went crowd surfing. And like the security guard grabbed me funny. I like bent my back in a weird way. I hopped off the stage and my knee ate shit on like this metal step. Like everything just went wrong. And after the show, I had a, so much adrenaline that I guess I didn't really feel the how, how intense the, in, the injury was. Mm -hmm. But then when I got back to Toronto and I got off the plane, I couldn't walk. It was like over. Wow. Yeah, it was intense. Crazy. It's been a lot. It's been a lot, but it also gave me an opportunity to like, rise above it because I've never trained as hard as I trained getting my back back to normal no pun intended mm -hmm. but I like worked my ass off I was working with like I, I think three different doctors were working on my shit I was working with the personal trainer I was working with the physiotherapist I was working with the chiropractor everything just to get my body back to normal so that I could sing again so that I could be out on the road again all these things so it's been a crazy long tumultuous, happy, memory-filled road from kiddo to before love came to kill us. Just hearing about your injury, it sort of made me start thinking about um, Michael Jordan in The Last Dance and him coming back from injuries and stuff. Yeah, that documentary, that, that series is so sick. I loved it. It's so dope. You've been watching that? What else have you been watching in quarantine? Um, that's pretty much it, to be honest, because me and my team have kind of figured out a way to not stop working so we've what just been you, working more what are you working on 
interviews, music, um, sharpening my skill, kind of taking the opportunity to train in a way that I haven't trained before. So I'm doing a lot more like singing lessons and a lot like practicing scales, um, doing more online stuff and t like connecting more with my fans. I have this app that's like a texting app. So fans. Oh, I'm already on it. You, I already get your text. <laughs> oh, it's lit. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, um, I gotta put that online again today, but I've been doing that a lot and, and it's just, I know it's a shitty time. Like obviously the, the, the whole the seed of everything, why the world is on pause right now sucks. There's a lot of people that are dealing with health issues. There's a lot of people that are, that are more at risk. It sucks, but life is duality. And if you look at the cup half full, it's not that bad of a time. If you're the one, if you're, if you're part of the population, that's not, severely at risk if you're part of the population that that like can handle a couple months of this being paused mm -hmm. it's not time to go inside to like go like introspective i'm talking about like inside yourself so yeah. i've been working a lot too i've been reading a lot of uh like self-help books which i'm a fan of i did this thing called deepak chopra's 21 day abundance meditation i saw you posting it on instagram every single day or maybe every other day you were posting excerpts from it correct yeah that's that's so i was doing two, i was doing that one and then i was doing this booklet called the one i was posting on instagram was called 21 days to resilience that's what it was called because i actually dm'd you i was like what's the book called but i'm what sure it's Oh, it's okay. Yeah. You probably get a million DMs a day. It's it was really cool that you were sharing that. I remember when you did this bit. God, it might have been like over a year or two years ago, where you were doing this bit about. Let me backstep that. You're a very authentic human, right? You're not someone that goes out into the universe and says, "I'm just gonna lie about who I am to everybody out there who's supporting my music." You're very much you represent what you were talking about—that duality the positive and the negative and you did that whole experiment do you remember that oh. experiment you did yeah you yeah where i was like a little bit yeah where i was deep in my negative i was like fuck this fuck that i'm just gonna be honest about everything that's going wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i remember that that was crazy that was interesting that was intense because i feel like i i i think it's if you want to excel and you want to be a better human, you obviously want to lean towards the positive and want to lean towards the sunlight, you know? You obviously want to do that. But that's the thing. It's impossible to be on that side all the time. But if it's impossible. It's impossible. So with that experiment, I kind of just wanted to... I started reading about... Um, is it Frederick Nietzsche? Some philosopher talks about your shadow self and, like, what mm -hmm. that means and what it means when you try to repress that because we can't be perfect humans. It's just impossible for us to right. be perfect humans beings and that when we try to repress our shadow self or our shadow side or our negativity it comes out and it manifests through different forms or mm -hmm. it's one of those things that if repressed can blow up one day like mm -hmm. and and that's how you have those people that are like great all the time and then one day out of the year they're fucking maniac devils and and no one knows why they snap but that's why so i was trying to embrace the negative in a different way because i do that in my music already i do that in my songs the majority of my songs are sad it, maybe why i'm not that sad in person, I guess, sometimes, but I was trying to do that um, with my thoughts, like just laying them out. And I feel like it helped me feel better. Like those, those, those few days felt, I felt lighter, you know, like what I didn't I, have to. My what words I like were, about when you share those things, though, in those journeys, because a lot of us, obviously, we all know inside that we have that duality, that we're both positive and negative all of the time. And there can be those moments, like you said, where we're more negative, but there's plenty of moments where you know, Instagram's telling us to cut off all the negative people in your life and to be positive. How did you go from the darker places where you injured yourself or you were feeling really down? Um, what were the tools that got you to looking at things more positively? Was it music or was it something else? Mm -hmm. I was lucky to have it because it gave me a bullseye. Like it gave me a goal, you know? And I feel like you can't that was it's a cliche i saying but it's true like you can't get where you're going unless you have a map how are you gonna know where you're going or what you're aiming for so i hope that i had that that as a bullseye like my goal was to just get back to being able to do shows and get back to being able to go to the studio till 5 a.m and wake up the next day and feel fine um but the tools that i used to get there i talk about these a lot too but i can't say enough about the power of your word and the power of affirmations that shit is crazy it's crazy how it is it's crazy how if you're not cautious about how you talk to yourself 
you could do yourself a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Like if you're constantly criticizing yourself all day or calling yourself stupid, or criticizing yourself in the mirror or having like low expectations for yourself, like that's exactly what life's going to give you. That's exactly what right. you're going to get. It's crazy. And it seems like such, I wish that, I wish that this was taught in schools. Like I wish that this was part of a curriculum because people, people always talk about like, Oh, girls and like girls and the way that society targets, how we embrace ourselves and how there's an entire industry based on girls not loving themselves because we're oh, supposed yeah. to make up. We're supposed to be this, be that, be the other. But if we taught that how you talk to yourself influences, how you end up loving yourself younger, that industry might be dead. We might be better people. And then and like it's just it's just so much. But anyways, that that was one of the tools that I used. It was was affirmations. And even on the days that I woke up feeling like shit, I would still wake up and I'd then I'd say today's a great day. Today's yeah. a great day. I was doing that every day and it helped. For me, I do gratitude journals in the morning and I'm always like preaching the power of gratitude journals because I think oh, they really yes. help. They do. I agree. Those things are magical, man. Crazy. But for people that don't really understand how to do a positive affirmation, which I think is a disconnect for a lot of people, it's not lying to yourself. It's just doing a positive affirmation. Can you give an example of a couple you do in the morning to get you going? Actually, um, so when I wake up, I, I try, it's, it's, this is the, this is, this is the fuck, this is the fucked up part. And I have to get over this hump because I know that this is one of my weaknesses. Mm -hmm. When I'm low, I'm I'm in, immersed in this shit and then I get better. But then when I get better, it's like, I forget that I'm like maintenance. You have to maintain because when you get better, you forget and you're like, oh, okay, I'm good. And then a few months later you get into a fucking hole and you wonder why, but it's because you didn't do maintenance. But anyways, the, the ones that I say, and I have to get back into the habit of doing now is when I'd wake up, I'd like immediately say I'm alive and God, I'm alive. Like I woke up to see another day and today's going to be great. But the fact that I'm alive makes it great already. Like, no matter what the day is, I'm alive. It's great. On my phone right now, like on my home screen, here, I'll read it out. On my home screen, I have, I am peace. I am light. I am forgiving. I am healing. I am love. And in moments when it is dark, I find my way back to the light. So I have that shit on my phone screen so that any time that, like, I put my phone down or pick my phone up, that's the first thing I see. Um, and... In the mirror, like I know it's so cheesy, but you think about it. If you like really, if you think about it or it's an outsider looking in and you look in the mirror and you call yourself beautiful, I get why someone on the outside that's never experienced it might call that cheesy. But that's a part of the journey to self-love is, is to be able to see your reflection and be like, it's beautiful. No matter what, I'm waking up in the morning, you look tired, your hair's frizzy, your unibrow's not shaved, whatever the fuck it is, but it's still beautiful. So I feel like that, that's one thing that I do that helps me. And do you think, do you attribute that to giving you this sense of confidence that you put out into the universe? Because when I look at you and I see what you're doing in the art that you put out, I very much look up to you because I feel like you have such a good sense of self in the Thank way that for us as women, I think you've touched on this a moment before. It's very hard. I feel like society always tried to teach us that we were without in certain ways. Yeah, but you yeah. found this ability to overcome that and be okay being you and anytime I watch any of your art or any of the stuff you put out on social media I think shit she's figured it out like and it's amazing to see thank you that's so um thank you I definitely I I'm I think I have moments of clarity but it's not constant like I have moments of weakness you know mm -hmm. and even there's songs that I know that I have that I know are like full of strength and power but there's also songs that are out there that are like this song called Same Side. I had to do a reaction video. So basically they play the video, they play the song and the video and then they want me to like narrate my reaction to the, to the piece, art piece mm -hmm. after it. And like 30 seconds in, I was like, I got sad. I'm like, this song is so, it's, it's just, it, I said it reeks of self, of lack of self-love. It reeks of it because I was at a low moment. I was at a low moment and the song, it's just sad, man. It's sad and it's depending on someone else and it's not being enough for yourself. It's, yeah. it's everything like that. But I feel like being able to put a spotlight mm -hmm. on your way gives you strength. Mm -hmm. Like that's strength because then it reminds me when I'm in this position now that I'm like, oh, fuck, I was there. So I got to make sure I maintain not to get there again. Mm -hmm. Or I was there. So 
and I have to know that now that I'm higher, I feel stronger, I feel confident, I can't let myself get too high because that's what causes plummets. And mm-hmm. that's that, that my dad said that to me when I was younger and I never forgot it. He's like, you got to make sure that when the, when, the, when, the, when the highs come, don't get too high. And when the lows come, don't get too low. So that you could just go even kill throughout life. And that's what's, that's Zen. That's the like, I'm right. good. I'm good if it goes up and I'm good if it goes down because I'm good because I'm breathing. Reach your so center. Good. Yeah. I feel like that's, I'm happy that, that, that's, that, that, that you think I figured it out. But some days are definitely hard. And I feel like just being honest, honest, even when it's ugly, being honest helps me find strength. Even when it's sad, even when it's not strong, even when it's insecure, if I'm honest, yeah. helps me find strength. Yeah, and I, that's why I think that you're such a captivating artist in the world because you are so genuinely authentic and it's not put on. You can just tell that you're being you and you're okay being you and you're not trying to act some kind of way. Um, and there's certain songs, like you said, same side. You know, I, I, I do think about that. I think we've all had those moments where you're fighting with someone and they're mad at you for something and you're mad at them for something, but you just want to be mad about the same thing. So you feel like you can at least come together and all that self-hate that we can all have sometimes. I, I think it was beautifully written. I mean, I get how it's hard for you to probably reflect on, but that and Intruders, that Intruder song, I don't know if anyone's ever said this to you before, and I know comparisons can be a touchy thing, but it gives me Amy Winehouse vibes, the way she wrote her lyrics and wrote those emotions into songs. What is the thing or the trick that you find where you can get yourself into that emotional place where you can make those emotions tangible within the music? Um, I think it's, I think that that comes from kind of what I said earlier, like my, my desire to just be honest, but that comes from somewhere else. Like that comes from pain because I've lost, I've lost, I've lost best friends, best, like I've, I've lost a best friend because he passed away. I lost another best friend in my life because I realized I had been lied to for eight years about like this whole fake world. I lost my, there's, uh, there's just been a lot of, and I don't want to do like the little fucking, like this violin when someone's like this, this person, that person, this person. Right. Me, the way that I internalized those experiences, I got to the point where I was like, it feels like everybody who was close to me lied to me. So I either beat them or I joined them. And there was a point in my life where I was like, maybe I should be cheating too. Maybe I should be lying too. Maybe I should be stealing too. Because everybody else is doing this. So why not? Because I'll get away with it. And I just got to let go of feeling guilty because that's the status quo. Um, but then I ended up going with the other decision, like with the, the, other, the fork in the road, I ended up going the other way. And the other way was be as brutally honest as possible and hope that the universe answers you with that same level of standard that you're setting for yourself answers you with people that are willing to give you that back, you know? So even, even when it's ugly, even, and that's partly why I don't have a lot of friends because a lot of people don't like, a lot of people want platitudes. A lot of people want like, no, this, this, this looks great. No, it's fine that you're cheating on your husband. No, it's fine that you're fucking, that you're, that you're stealing from your company. No, it's fine that you're lying on your Instagram. Like, no, anybody that's in my life is in my life because I'm holding them to higher standards because I'm trying to grow as a person. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I feel like because I have those kind of, that kind of drive, to be honest, that's why in my music there's so many secrets that I don't really talk about, but there's a lot of secrets in the actual songs, you know? Yeah. Do you feel like um, writing music saved you or was therapy in some sort of way? Yeah, totally. I think that, I think that if I didn't have music, like, fuck. I, after my first heartbreak, I kind of let everything go. Like, I was decent in school. I was decent. And then when I got my heart broken, I grade, like, decent, like, eight. Like, I was in eight. I was good. Yeah. 11, grade 11 came by, and that's when my heart got broken. Mm-hmm. And I almost didn't graduate. I almost didn't graduate because I was like, my emotions just took over. I was so, de- that was the most intense depression. And my family didn't know what to do. Teachers didn't know what to do. Yeah. I couldn't be in class because in class I was just crying. And I'd be trying to like hide crying. Like, in cl- like it was fucked. I couldn't get a hold of my, of my emotions. And I remember my music teacher being cool because there was a back room in the music room. 
And I'd always be like, can I just chill in this room? And that room had a piano in it, but just so that I wouldn't be in class crying. At least I'd be there and I wouldn't go to lunch either with my girls because I would cry in the calf. So I would just end up in that little room in the music room. And I'd bring my guitar sometimes or I'd have the piano and then I'd just start making music in there. That was kind of, oh, that's cute. <laughs> making noise. So I was like, let me just move him on my lap so he gets quiet. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, 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 I think that, like, I owe a lot to my music teacher not being an asshole and letting me skip class to be in that back room because it helped. It just gave me, it gave me a, like, nice little haven yeah. to cry, you know, and make songs. When did you first discover music or start playing instruments? Um, my mom says that she caught me singing opera when I was, like, three. And we were living at Jane and Finch at the time, which is this area in Toronto that that's not the best area, but right at the corner, there's this music school in the basement of a pizza hut. And okay. dragged me, she took me there and, like, begged the, prof the the music teacher to take me and he was like she's three years old she's too little like she can't and she begged and begged with her broken english convinced this guy to take me on and so i started playing piano when i was three but then i ended up finding dance and i love dance and then my dad had a guitar at the crib and i feel like that accessibility to it helped me a lot too and i used to sing in church i dropped piano i dropped dance but like guitar and singing was kind of always home and yeah, I just would sing at church with my pops too, play guitar yeah. in the choir. So when you're writing your songs, are you writing them on guitar, ukulele, or piano, or do you just start with writing lyrics? I never, I rarely ever start with writing lyrics. Like, rarely, like, maybe one out of 200 songs, maybe, if that, but it's, like, rare that I start with lyrics first. It's always, um, if I do that, it just ends up being a poem. But the songs always come like simultaneously with the music so it's either me on the guitar and then whatever whatever is going on in my life it's just a reflection of what's happening in my life ends up coming out uh, but it could be anything it could be guitar it could be piano it could be ukulele it could be a beat sometimes like producers just send me beats and it depends what comes what do you prefer though do you prefer the stuff that you're making on the instruments yourselves or do you prefer working with beats um I don't know. It's just, it kind of, I don't know if I have a preference. I think, I think my preference would be like live instrumentation. Like when I have the, the guitar or when if I'm working with a producer and he has the piano in front of him and he has the guitar in front of him because, because it's in the moment, like the beat's dope. And I'm not mad at it because there's songs that I've made that I love that are that are from beats that got my email. Mm -hmm. But the the magic that's a little lost in that point is just that like different. It's a timeline, right? The beat was made on this day that had this sort of energy, and then it came right. to me and sort of energy. So it's this amalgamation, which is beautiful in itself too. Like if you you can squint and see the beauty in that too, because it's this timeline of art. But what I think I love the most is when it's in the moment, because whatever that producer is going through in his life. Whatever's happening in his life, whatever is heavy on his heart is coming out through the guitar or is coming out through his piano, you know? Yeah. And whatever's happening to me is coming out through my voice and coming out through my words. So I feel like the alchemy is different when it all in time. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like the industry's pigeonholed you a little bit as a certain type of genre artist when you're broader or are you okay with how you're portrayed in the industry? I don't really give a shit. Like, I don't, I don't. I don't really give a shit because the industry's not feeding me, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then, and then if the question goes, okay, well, what about like how people are pigeonholing you? But I don't think that anybody that resonates with my music is concerned about what genre it is. I think they're just concerned about how it makes them feel. Yeah. And because I've made it a point for every project to have a broad spectrum, I don't think that someone that actually took the time to listen to it can actually call it a genre. Like I've always said in interviews, they're like, what do you, what genre would you categorize it on? Like it's, it's Tarantino music. It's Quentin Tarantino music. It's a movie, you know, it's supposed to be that. It's supposed to be highs and lows, be romance and violence. It's supposed to be winter and summer. It's heaven and hell. It's all those things at once. And I think that I feel, I still feel free to do that. Like I don't feel yeah. pressure by anybody's label, so I don't really, I don't really yeah. give a shit. That's good.
That's good. I like to hear that. And it's good you have a good handle on it. Because for me as a fan, sometimes I'll read stuff and I'll be like, but she's not just that. She's so much more than that. Like you're missing half of what she's all about, at least. But I like to hear you say that. Um, now on the latest album, Before Love Came to Kill Us, you had a bunch of different artists that you teamed up with. And I'd have been asking fans for questions. And one of them wanted to know what it was like to work with Six Black. Yo, Black is sick. Black is, is probably one of the most zen motherfuckers I've ever worked with in my entire life. Like, the man is just vibes. It's just nice, man. And sometimes it's not always relaxed, you know, especially not the video shoots. But even at the video shoot, it was just relaxed. It was a chill vibe. He's talented as fuck. He's, he's real as shit, too, which I appreciate very much. Like, I just appreciate people that put honesty as, like, number one priority. And I feel like he's always been very honest in how he is, like, who he is as a person, how he moves, and in his music. Um, and, and then Porter just went platinum yesterday. I just found out. So, so cool. I had it, man. So black, black is lit, man. Black's good in my books. How many platinums do you have now? Three? I think so. It's, That's um. Amazing. Yeah. Thank Grammy you. nomination too. Have you gotten, um, Juno awards? Yes. I have two Juno awards in my, at my parents' house. Where do you keep those? Um, well, actually, one isn't at my parents' house because my dad's paranoid. And then the other is somewhere, some, I think my, like, I just came to terms with the fact that my mom wants to put it out. Like, she literally, I shit you not, three weeks ago, just asked me, like, mija, please. Like, she just wants to put them out because I just feel weird about them being, like, out and about. Right, right. But she wants to, so she, I think she's putting it as, like, a, a centerpiece or something. I don't know something like that something crazy something uh, yeah. something not reasonable but whatever but it's cool though it's just one of those things right where we all have to fight that inner demon that tells us we shouldn't be proud of ourselves yeah. and that we have to be overly humble when you've done amazing Yo, things you're right that's true man self self awareness you're right because if it's it's true it's that like feeling of not wanting to be like boastful but yeah. also still being self aware enough to recognize that you deserve happiness after you've achieved certain like successes yeah yeah so now that you're staying in an airbnb away from your family in quarantine how, how is that i mean are you lonely no that's cool um i've like i said like it was the, i've taken the opportunity to go inside so doing a lot of meditations doing a lot of like self-work that Deepak Chopra one is the fucking shit because it comes the, online. It comes with like um, like a like a task journal thing that you follow for the twenty one days too. Mm -hmm. And there's things that I've thought about or people I've thought about situations I've thought about that I haven't thought about in maybe fifteen years. Wow. So it yeah crazy like like not to get too deep but like one one thing. I hadn't thought about it. I just started, there was one point where it said, list this and then list this. And then how do you feel about this? And I just burst it into tears about something I hadn't thought about in so long. I didn't even know I was holding that, but the, but that meditation helped me find it, you know? Yeah. So I just been out of that. So I think, I yeah. think with in my head, I don't get too lonely. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of company. <laughs> yeah. And you're staying busy. You're working on things. I think right before quarantine started, you were on with Trevor Noah, right? On the daily show. And I remember you were sitting on the show and he, you guys were just like talking about love. And all of a sudden you just said this one thing and I don't want to misquote you, but you shot directly like an arrow directly through the heart of the issue. And I love how you always just find this way to take a concept we all know and hone in right on the target. And you just nail it in a way that's said in maybe a sentence or two is that something you taught yourself is that something from knowing how to write poetry like how have you learned how to make complicated emotions into simply understood concepts daniel daly from division from the 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 group division he um they're signed to ovio he's actually a mentor of mine he was my program leader when i was at this youth program in toronto called the remix project that place changed my life. When I was there, they, they like provide free studio time, provide mentorship, provide like opportunities for workshops to talk. Mm -hmm. Like Rico Love came in once. Kendrick Lamar came in years before me to come talk to the kids. Like 
um drake's 40 like over your 40s from there there's a yeah. future out of there too like there's a lot of there's a lot of ties and he was my mentor at the time and i remember writing songs and showing him and he took me aside and i was like yeah critique me man i'm here for it and he was like okay and he looked at one of my songs and he was like this is redundant you need to cut the fat you're saying something here twice again that you already said in the beginning you have to get to like it, it he he just was he 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 was honest and he was able to to like critique me objectively and i was able to receive it and i'll never forget those lines like cut the fat from the songs cut the fat make it potent make it and so it's something that i've that i've worked on like it's something that i've that i've consciously worked on to know that and he said something else that i'll never forget and as a songwriter it it, it really helped for me to hear that because it's true he's like there's nothing new under the sun. Like, we all go through sim such similar things. We all go through heartbreak. We all go through loss. We all go through falling in love. There's no new emotion that's under the sun. The only thing that's new is how you say it. But what it is, it's going to be the same thing. It's just how you say it. And so then I started just being a student and even like with great songs, hearing them. And there's an example I could give. Like, you know how there's so many songs where people say, put your hands up. Hands up in the air, throw them up. People love to say that shit. But when you look at great writers, great creators, they'll do it and they'll do it in the most poetic, different way. And Bruno Mars did it with, is it 24 karat? What's that song called? Put your pinky finger to the moon. That's put your hands up. All he's saying is put your hands up. That's it. Put your pinky finger to the moon. What? And it's so cool. It's so visual. It's so direct. It's potent. It's, an, it's something, it's an action that has been done throughout the ages. But it just sounds new. Or Pharrell with like, clap your hands if you, what is it? Clap your hands if you know that happiness is the truth. Cause I'm, you know, all he's saying, is clap. if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Like, that's what the fuck? It's the same thing. And it's just said in this different way. It's just so cool. But I owe it a lot to Daniel, to Daniel Daly, because he kind of opened my eyes to, to that. There's nothing new. It's just how you say it. And if you say it potently and poetically enough and condense it to make it like, mm -hmm. hit, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and for us as the listeners and the fans, that's just such a special thing. People like yourself, your skill is so rare. You know, a lot of people have talent and they can sing and do different pieces of being an artist and a musician, but you really have the ability to cut to the heart of things. You can play the songs yourself. You're writing them yourself. You're out there. You can do the dancing. You have the charisma. You have this sense of wisdom wise beyond your years. Like, the fact that more of the world doesn't know about you, I'm not trying to gas you up, like it blows my mind, you know? And you already have three platinum singles, but to me, I see you selling out arenas. I sell, see you in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame one day. Like I see you being one of the biggest artists in the entire world. I'm just waiting for everybody to catch up and find out about you. I willing, man. I willing. I'm at it. My whole team is working for that. It's kind of been a dream for a long time, but thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for yeah. the vote. Yeah, I just have a couple more questions. What has it been like, right? Obviously, we're doing this virtually, but what has it been like releasing an album in the middle of a global pandemic? Because no one could have predicted that this was going to happen, and here we are, months later. I was scared. We almost canceled it. We almost stopped it, especially because the whole concept behind the album is life and death, and it felt like I was trying to make it a catalyst for people that maybe don't think about life and death every day to be more cognizant of their mortality. And when all this happened, it seemed like instead of being a catalyst, it was just going to be a theme song to like the, the apocalypse. Um, yeah. And I didn't want to seem insensitive because I know that my relationship with death is very def is very different than like what the majority of the population's relationship with death is. Mm -hmm. So I was apprehensive. I told the team and my guys were like, we'll do what you want to do. You take the lead. If you want to hold off, we'll hold off. If you want to go, we'll pull the trigger. Still confused. So then... Shout out Instagram, because I went on Instagram and I did one of those polls. Yeah. I was like, I'm concerned about releasing the album. I think I'm going to hold it. How do you guys feel? Because I wanted to ask like my fans how they felt about it. I guess I should have seen this. Like 97% of people saying, drop it. What the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. And so then we did it. We were definitely scared. I think we were, we were one of the first like to drop music during that time, because everybody was kind of on pause. Everybody wasn't moving because nobody knew how to move. 
Mm-hmm. So I was a little apprehensive about being kind of the guinea pig to figure it out, but I'm happy with how people received it. I'm happy that that I'm happy that people have resonated with it. You know, I'm happy people are taking it, and I'm happy we did it. And I'm happy we didn't hold off because I've had this album for a minute, so I'm happy that it's out fully living. Do you think that the experience of quarantine are you going to come out of it a different person than how you started going into it? Totally. I'm not completely different, but hopefully better. I think I'm going to come out better. You've I feel been better. working on yourself really hard. I mean, it's very obvious when you show all the stuff you do on social media. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. I hope. Like, I feel somebody, somebody, was it Jerry Lorenzo? Somebody made a quote and they were like, the only way it's a waste is if you come out the other end the same. That's the only way that this time is going to be a complete waste is if you come out the other end and you haven't learned a skill, you haven't developed, you haven't healed, you haven't created, you haven't, like, nothing, nothing productive. Anybody who hasn't done shit these last two, few months, they're the ones that are going to be fucked, you know? But something, something, even if it's minor, even if it's, even if it's telling yourself you're beautiful in the mirror every day, even if that's something new that you've acquired, I think that, I think that, I think that it's going to be a transformative time for a lot of people. And it's been for me. What have you created in quarantine? I've created piles and piles of signed posters and signed. <laughs> um, I think I've created new ways for my brain to work when I'm frustrated. Yeah. Uh, and poetry, I've been doing a lot of writing. Well, like I've been doing some writing that way, but my creative energy has gone a lot to my soul, like myself, as opposed to out. I've kind of been putting it in, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and also new creative ways of figuring out how to work. Like my team and I, I'm, I'm really proud of how we were able to pivot because we haven't, our workflow hasn't stopped. We've just kind of, yeah. we had, and we're using different applications. We're thinking about different ways of, thinking about different ways of how I interact with the people that support my shit. Like everything's just been, like my creativity has gone into learning and pivoting and self-betterment. You're an amazing human. I'm so thoroughly impressed by you all of the time. I was super nervous coming into this interview just because I love what you create in all Mm -hmm. aspects of what you create. It's just so, there's very few artists that um, I think resonate in the same way you do. And again, I know a comparative universe isn't the best one to live in, but it was November, 2016 when I discovered Billie Eilish, right? And I was like, oh, this Ocean Eyes song, right? And I want to say it was four months later, maybe even three, that I discovered the, some of the songs from Kiddo. And it was the same thing. And like the way you impacted me was like the same way when I first heard Billie. And that's what makes me even more sure that you're going to blow up and be at arenas and not just opening up for Billie Eilish one day on rescheduled tour dates. I mean, you, <laughs> you really are special. Um, and I want to thank you for taking the time. And I want to try to do one quick exercise. All right, let's do it. If it doesn't work, that's okay. We can quit. Um, I have three different concepts. And since you're such an amazing poet and songwriter, I want to see if you could take something simple and turn it into Jesse Reyes style. Okay, let's do it. I lost my keys. Okay. Go, go. Oh, oh dear, oh dear God, please. I lost my keys and I gotta go. I'm late for the road, but I lost my keys. I love it, I love it. Okay, here's another one. I'm hungry, I just want pizza. My man wants to, uh my man wants to come over, yeah, he wants to give me thick, (laughs) yeah, but I just want some pizza, yeah, and some cinnamon sticks. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay last one that one's really good um i need my mask 
my hands but I don't know if you did you think you're God but I know I'm human so here's sanitizer I'm gonna need it back six feet away please put on your mask because I need my own and if you don't that's fine though you don't got a nose like a motherfucking rhino so I know that you could put on your mask if I give you hand sanitizer, I'm gonna need that shit back. <laughs> so good. I knew you could do it. I love it. Thank you. That was Thanks. awesome. So, Jesse, I really appreciate you taking the time. Pardon? I appreciate you taking the time. So much time. Oh, okay. My dog appreciates it. He's been sitting right here. I've been trying to keep him quiet. <laughs> That's good. I'm happy he's good too. <laughs> Thank you so much for the time and for supporting early. I appreciate that too. Yeah, stay healthy and I'm sure we'll be talking to you soon. Fuck yeah, girl. Be safe. All right. Okay, bye.